begin our gathering with an acknowledgement of country. The land on which we meet is the sovereign and unceded country of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present, those who have cared for the lands and waters of this country since its creation. We have heard the call of the statement from the heart for voice, treaty and truth. We will respond to its invitation by working for a society in which there is justice for all Indigenous people. Please be seated. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, wherever you've come from, wherever you're going to, whatever you believe, whatever you do not believe, you are welcome here. To welcome those of you who are here with us in the church and to welcome people who will join us online by watching the video later in the day. I want to welcome anyone who is a visitor or a newcomer to the church. And just to remind you that if you've got a mobile phone with you, please switch it to silent or turn it off. It's the morning after the referendum on the constitutional recognition and a voice to Parliament for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Last night, we did not have to wait long for the results. However, First Peoples have long waited for justice for the right to have a say in matters that affect their lives. For First Nations people here in the church or watching online, I acknowledge with sorrow the deep hurt caused by the racism, explicit and implicit during the campaign and deep disappointment in the result. For those of you in our congregation who volunteered to support the Yes campaign, facing increasing hostility and angry no voters. May you know the support and gratitude of many members of our community, who though they might not have been able to do as much as you, were encouraged by the conversations that we have had in church to have conversations with friends and family and neighbors. The referendum is not the end of the struggle. Our gathering today recognizes heartbreak and seeks healing in the traditions of our faith, honors hope and the power of love that has been generated by people who walk together toward a vision of justice and peace, a vision of a nation where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are recognized, respected, and listened to so that they may live safe and well. And that community of solidarity that has been created that has not been lost. This is a sacred time and a sacred place, a place for questions more profound than answers, vulnerability more powerful than strength, and a peace that can pass all understanding. This is a sacred time and a sacred place. We sing together our first hymn, how great the mystery of faith.
This week has been an intense week. We have gathered here in this church to listen to Gary Deverell speak about a voice for country, the ecological wisdom of First Peoples, and some of us gathered here on Friday to be part of the Uniting Church online vigil for Referendum Eve. And all that has been, has been. The work that has been done is done. And now we come to a time of stillness and open ourselves to awareness of the spirit still moving among us. Let us pray. The face of the sacred is hidden from humankind, clouded in the mystery of holiness. And yet we glimpse enough for faith to grow as the way of Jesus Sophia opens before us in the witness of the ages, in the riches of the word and the beauty of the world. The spirit lives and moves up within us and we find God's presence in friend and stranger. We know we cannot fully know the divine, but still we pray for that sacred connection which lifts our hearts and brings insights of grace. In our fears and doubts, we long for certainties. May we approach this time in gentleness, aware and assured of grace. And remembering Jesus, we pray together. Ground of all being, mother of life, father of the universe, your name is sacred beyond speaking. May we know your presence. May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. May there be food for the human family today and for the whole earth community. Forgive us the falseness of what we have done as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our time of conflict, but lead us into new beginnings. For the light of life, the vitality of life, and the glory of life are yours now and forever. Amen. The promise of peace is a promise that is sometimes hard to touch, but we are assured of the peace of God with us. May the peace of divine presence be with you. I invite you to share words and gestures of peace with those around you. A reading from the Hebrew Bible, Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took these from them, formed them in a mould, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proper 
proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to Yahweh. They rose early next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. Yahweh said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who you brought up out of the land of Egypt. Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored Yahweh and said, O sovereign God, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and Leah and Rachel, your servants. How you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So Yahweh's mind was changed, and the disaster that threatened the people was forestalled. For stories of faith, ancient and new,
A reading from the early church from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Therefore, my family in Christ, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in Jesus Christ in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in Christ. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Saviour always, Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Our Saviour is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, my family, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things that you have learned and received and heard and noticed in me, do them, and the God of peace will be with you. For the early Jesus communities faithfully following the way. The contemporary reading is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. We, gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time in a memorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom, remain attached thereto, and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished, and coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise that peoples possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our ch children are alienated from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. 
and our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future.
open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts to love. The Māori people of Aotearoa New Zealand have a concept of rahui. Rahui is a restriction of access to a place of death or sorrow, a time for leaving alone land and water where there has been tragedy, to leave it alone to allow for healing, a time to wait. Waiting for God's justice is not easy. The wait can be discouraging, disappointing, and disheartening. From the margins of our world, the dispossessed and the disenfranchised have been waiting for such a long time, crying out for relief. The plight of the world's wretched is compounded by what, it seem, what sometimes seems to be a God that cannot hear their cries. Is God dead? or deaf, or worse, does God not care enough for those who suffer? Where is God in the outcome of this referendum for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament? Each day we read of people who die because of the horrors of war in Ukraine and now in Palestine and Israel people who die of hunger, preventable diseases, and disasters brought about by human-induced climate change. When we consider needless death and suffering, it seems to deny more than confirm the love of God. How do we account for the failure of such a small measure that held the possibility of changing the circumstances for people who have descent who are descendants of the first inhabitants of these lands now called Australia. Marcia Langton, co-author of the report outlining a framework for the voice, said yesterday, a majority of Australians have said no to an invitation from Indigenous Australia with a minimal proposition to give us a bare say in matters that affect our lives advice that doesn't even need to be taken by the parliament. There is so much grief and also so much determination in the responses of Aboriginal people. Last evening, as the loss of the referendum became known, there came a request for silence in words that reminded me of the wisdom of Rahui. A statement from Indigenous Australians who back the voice reads, when we determine a new direction for justice and our rights, let us once again unite. Let us convene in due course to carefully consider our path forward. We are calling a week of silence from tonight to grieve. So today I am not going to analyse or blame, but rather I will question my faith in the tradition of our ancestors in faith. If God is not a supernatural being who either can't or won't rescue the poor and the dispossessed, how are we to understand the divine, the holy, and the place of faith in human struggles for justice today? What, if anything, can we learn about divine presence from a very ancient story recorded in the book of Exodus, told so that people might understand the connections between their faith in God and the way that their society was ordered and the way that people were to live their lives. The Exodus narrative tells the story of the long extended pilgrimage of the people of Israel who after they escaped slavery from Egypt, witnessed remarkable events that sustained them in the wilderness toward their new home, a land flowing with milk and honey. The passage that we heard today tells of a time when the people became anxious, tired of waiting for a word from the one who had brought them out of bondage in Egypt. Moses, their leader, is away on the mountain with God. 
The people at the bottom of the mountain begin to despair while their divinely appointed leader at the top of the mountain continues a long dialogue with God. They feel abandoned by Moses and the, by the God whom Moses represented. Camped at the foot of Mount Horeb, landless and with few prospects for meeting their daily needs, they begin to wonder if this God of life was going to accompany them on their long journey through the valley of death. Wouldn't it be better to have a more tangible God, one that can be seen and touched like a golden calf? The building and worshipping of the golden calf is often represented as a terrible failure on the part of the Hebrew people. They had been liberated and in a failure of gratitude. Now they were apparently worshipping foreign gods. But, help, but scholars say that they were not worshipping foreign gods, that they simply wanted the reassurance the comfort of something, someone else standing in Moses' place. Not idolatrous, but an alternative representation of Yahweh. In this story and in our own life, we can see a human longing to put our trust in something mysterious and greater than ourselves. In this story, we can see the human quest for spirituality. But the story of the golden calf reminds us that not all objects of our spiritual longing are equal. There are many contemporary false gods before us. Race and gender and wealth, white supremacy, our nation, military might. The people of Israel seem to have absorbed a sorry les lesson from their former oppressor in Egypt when they turned to a wisdom based in fear and expressed in overwhelming, controlling, and coercive force. What makes us feel secure today? What do we place our trust in? What soothes our souls? What sorry lessons have we absorbed from the ideology of neoliberalism that refuses to acknowledge discrimination and systemic disadvantage? The conclusion of the story can be challenging to those of us who have a post-theistic understanding of God. And it's important as we hear this story to remember that all of our talk about God is a metaphor. The story concludes with the mountaintop dialogue. God finds out about the people's unfaithfulness and loses it, threatening a terrible revenge. In the face of God's anger, Moses steps boldly between the fearful people and the God who is ready to destroy the joint. The encounter illustrates the kind of faith that Moses had in the face of this God with whom humans can dialogue. Radical trust in God evokes audacious faith. It not only permits but requires our questioning. Moses demands that God behave as God, that God remember and honor the covenant, which God has been accusing the people of failing to keep. Moses holds God to God's promises. Ironically, later in the story, following the passage we heard today, is a horrific description of Moses' murderous rage against the people because of their worship of the golden calf. So let's be clear, not every verse of the Bible is equally valid in its depiction of God's nature. And our approach to scripture should not be to acquire facts about the divine, but to listen for what the tradition does have to teach us and to reject all that would foster violence and revenge. So this is what I hear in the conclusion of Moses' dialogue with God. As Christians, we claim that we and all humanity have been made in God's image. 
In this story, we can understand that we are made in the image of God, of a God who has deep, deep feelings. Not only the negative emotions of anger and disappointment expressed in this text, but positive emotions of love and forgiveness and a yearning for justice. The understanding of the holy portrayed in this story may be strange to us, but remember the idea of God, of sacred energy, has evolved through tens of thousands of years of human history, and the Exodus saga is just one part of that evolution. I don't believe in a God who intervenes or chooses not to intervene. I don't think that the power of God is that kind of power. But I do believe in the divine glimpsed in the Exodus story, the spirit presence who yearns for liberation, who feels deeply the pain of injustice and suffering, and who accompanies the dispossessed and the marginalized in their trials. This God calls us now, on this morning after the referendum, to act in solidarity as agents of healing and hope and reconciliation. There are many other biblical and non-biblical sources which resource our search for the sacred and sustain our desire to touch holiness in our lives. Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians from prison where he was held captive by Rome because of his faith in Christ. And there's a continuity between Paul's writing and the things that the Israelites were learning in the wilderness. The tender love and care the deep wisdom and many gifts that guided Israel in the desert and nurtured the young church in Philippi have been passed on to us today to strengthen and guide us 2,000 years later. The passage refers to a powerful theme that runs through the scriptures. Do not be afraid. Don't worry. Be not afraid. I go before you always. God is with us, close at hand, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Concentrate, Paul says, on the very best things, the true, the honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, excellent, praiseworthy things. Keep up the good work, keep the faith. Paul closes his letter by drawing a picture of what it looks like to be like Jesus in our daily lives, to make our commitments to the grand things of peace and justice and love and healing become reality in our everyday lives through the day-to-day, small-scale choices that we make in supermarkets, on the streets where we walk or cycle or drive, at our homes, and in a thousand other forks in the road where we make the real choices that either express or diminish the grand goals that we hold. Perhaps we can learn to love humankind better by loving the people that we encounter each day, including the people with whom we bitterly disagree, who believe the disinformation spread in mainstream and social media. But living like this is not possible without being grounded in the spirit. The words Paul uses apply to churches today, especially when we are feeling small and overpowered by the various forms of empire that surround us alarmed by the dissemination of untruth, pressured by a culture that preaches a very different message from the gospel, discouraged or confused about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Paul writes words 
that are both stirring and gentle. Rejoice. Do not worry about anything. Pray, and the peace of God will guard your hearts. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received. In the aftermath of the referendum, who are the guides for our vision and direction? How on this day can we feel the God of peace in our midst, in the shared story of our congregation and our nation? After the referendum, we need peace, not a false peace of agreeing to disagree, but a, but a peace that makes space for healing and hope, for a voice like the voice of Thomas Mayo who said, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander justice movement and reconciliation movement is a very resilient movement. We have had our setbacks in history, some very big setbacks in our history. The movement always returns, and I am absolutely confident on this fact that it will return. Today, may we hold on to the hope of justice and joy for all people, for our nation and for the peoples of the world. May we be agents of reconciliation, as Paul called the followers of Jesus to be, in spite of what has been, holding to hope that after the time of silence, the movement of justice and reconciliation expressed in the statement from the heart will go on. Amen.
The first part of the prayers of the people is a prayer for after the referendum, written by the Reverend Sharon Hollis, President of the Uniting Church. Let us pray. God of ancient days, we give you thanks for the ways in which First Nations people have cared for country since creation and for their unbroken sovereignty over their lands and waters. We give you thanks for the ways in which they encountered you through law, custom and ceremony and for their particular insights into your ways. We give you thanks for the Uniting Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress, for the ways it nurtures indigenous spirituality and shares holistic ministry with First Nations people. We pray for all First Nations people today, acknowledging all they endure as a result of colonization and lamenting the racism and vitriol experienced across the referendum campaign. We pray for our nation, that following the referendum we might seek unity in reconciliation, justice and truth-telling. We pray for our church, that we might live into our covenant more fully and continue walking together as first and second peoples. In the name of Christ, our Lodestar. And today we also pray for peace in the Middle East. God of compassion, may your spirit embrace all those whose lives are torn apart by violence and death in Israel and Palestine. Let arms reach out in healing rather than aggression. Let hearts mourn rather than militarize. Let us remember that it is a matter of faith that all people, Israelis and Palestinians, deserve to live in peace and unafraid with the right to determine their future together. God of justice, Give strength to those who long work for a just peace, who may feel that their work is fruitless now. Strengthen their resolve. We pray that religious leaders will model unity and reconciliation across lines of division, and that political leaders listen with their hearts as they seek peace and pursue it. May all people choose the rigorous path of just peace and disavow violence. God of love, we pray for Palestine and Israel, people, land and creatures. Peace is a gift shared at the meals of memory with Christians, Muslims and Jews. May your people break bread, not bodies. May love and compassion prevail on all your holy mountains. And in a time of silence, we pray for all in need of compassion and care, for peace and justice for people and planet. Hear our prayers, O Holy One. Sustain us to seek the common good. Take all that we are and nurture us into a transforming hope for the world. In your many names we pray. Amen. In our Sunday gathering, we dedicate in prayer gifts given in many ways to sustain the life of our community. We pray together. We give to restore life. We give to heal the broken relationships. We give as a step on the journey to renewed sharing. Use our gifts, God, to restore, heal, and renew us in faith with one another. Amen.
go from here to live out the covenant between first and second peoples of our church and our land. Confront and challenge injustice wherever you see it. Act justly and insist that others do the same. Rejoice in the richness of our diverse cultures and learn from them. Celebrate and demonstrate the unity we share in our common humanity. Collaborating with the spirit to bring about the reconciliation of all creation. We say the words of blessing together. May the sacred creator of this great south land give us strength. May the memory of Jesus who calls us to be a just nation give us courage. And may the spirit of peace who shares the journey with us be our inspiration. Amen.